Good evening, YouTubers. Welcome back to Sugarly Tube TV. It's Tuesday night. This is our Part B, Episode 17, Part B special, all about the Hillman Impension and Ben Bolt interviewing him, etc. And also the bit that I couldn't fit on Sunday night's video, which is all about the crankshaft machining. And then also, if you're not fed up of hearing from me, you can go on to watch Part C, which I'll also upload, which is a firework display and some stock car racing, which you might find a bit weird, but I do know that for a fact there's people that watch this channel that don't have the mo mobility they used to have. So if you didn't manage to get to a firework display, you chaps can sit down and watch 10 minutes of wonderful fireworks from Hednesford Hills Racetrack, which was absolutely sensational weekend. Anyway, straight into this now. It's just a quick intro before we get into Ben's interview. This is the engine we're talking about. I went there quizzing him, basically. I wanted him to tell me, because he was there at the time, all about these experimental engines. Now, this is an imp engine. This is the experimental one in 1965 he did for the rally cars. The main difference is, of course, it's sand cast. I put an imp front cover on so you can see it's roughly 5 eighths of an inch taller. It has five main bearings instead of three main bearings, like an imp engine. So uh, the idea of this job was, from what I understand from Ben and other people that have kindly contacted me over the Dennis Jones engine, is they wanted, Roots wanted to build a 998 imp engine for the imp sport that was going to come out later in 66. So they were testing all this. It's all homologation special stuff for, you know, the days of Tiny Lewis and Rosemary Smith, the rally cars, the works rally cars. If you look at one of the pictures of the rally cars back in the day, you can actually notice that the, the carburettors are higher up. And that's because they had this cylinder head fitted. Now, you'll see in the interview, Ben talks all about the uh, cylinder head that was devised to go on these engines. It was called a deep angle head. So as you can see, the angle is a lot a lot steeper on the inlet ports. And this, this head was designed by Coventry Climax. Um, if you look, it's actually got an FWH number on the cam carry, which stands for Featherweight Hillman, perhaps? Not sure. I know FWN stands for Featherweight Marine, so it could be Hillman. And this head was specifically done for Group 5 Alan Fraser Engineering. And I don't believe this head has ever run. It's too clean. It's not been blasted. It's too, it's too bright in some of the areas. So I'm going on. What we'll say... Let Ben explain what happened in the video, how they came about it. Unfortunately, even in 1966, the Roots Group was in trouble, apparently, financially. You know, um, obviously, the British government had put a lot of money into the job in Scotland, but the, the way it was all working was a bit crazy because apparently the, the blocks were cast in Scotland and then they were shipped on a train, shipped on a train, carriaged on a train back down to Coventry where they were assembled as uh, engine units and then and then sent back to Scotland to be put in the cars so there was a lot of problems going on at the time and I suspect there was some financial issues which is probably why all this got axed and, and it never went into production so a shame because you know obviously that's a lovely die casting that's a sand casting and you can see it I think this is early it hasn't got all the web extra strengtheners on it and stuff but that would have been absolutely awesome if they'd put that in production. Anyway, never mind. We're happy with what we got. It works a treat. A few more images there of the head. You can see it's a much shallower chamber. Um, we've not touched on tuning this yet, but we'll do that when Dennis's engine... Now, Dennis, if you did watch the other video, Dennis has got a five-bearing block, but that is a brand new one by the Guntons. It's a copy of that. It was homologated by Dallas, etc., in the HSCC when the Gunsons wanted to race with the five bearing engine in the HSCC. So that's another story. I want to go straight into Ben's interview now before we run out of time. Press record. Right, YouTubers, we're, we're here with Ben Bolt. Ben Bolt has very kindly allowed me to interview him and ask him some questions regarding his history and the Hillman Imp engine. Now, I know a lot of you guys got excited when you saw the five bearing block that belongs to Dennis that we, we'd, we'd bought from the Gunsons, the one that's been remanufactured. Well, Ben had a part in, in the original um, development of the engine in, in the roots department back in the day. So I'll stop waffling now. Let Ben tell you the start. And this is the actual what happened because he was there. 
Um, where do we start? Basically, the engines were designed in experimental department for competition department. Right. They were manufactured. The majority of the machining was done on the track. They actually went down the... the oh, down, down the main imp track? So there was like... an the imp track. Right. Because um, they're a little bit taller, aren't they? They are taller. Um, the final machining was finished off in experimental. Some of it finished off in comp. Some finished off in the tool room. Wow. Um, and then they were all assembled in competition department, mostly by Phil Davidson. Right. Um, Phil now does Lotus Sunbeam engines. Right. And some of them came up to us. We did some extra development work on them, put them on the dyno, ran them on the dyno, found one or two faults, corrected the faults. Do you remember any of the figures that you saw? And were they, were they 1,000 cc at this stage, the fire bearing? They were, no, they were 998. 998 were they? 998, they were cross pistons. So right. an aluminium bore, Dykes rings on the pistons so that you were running steel rings or cast iron rings up, up an aluminium bore. Yeah, because the block that Bob Jones bought had an aluminium bore and it all picked up. Yeah. 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 So that's, that's why. And that was the problem with them. And we used to run them on the eddy current dyno. The reason we did that was the fact that we could shove oil down the plug holes. Right. Motor them up on there um, for a little bit. Then put the spark plugs back in once you did shot most of the oil out. And then you could get it motoring slightly and then press the go button. Otherwise, what happened was they just seized instantly. Wow, so this is early development, this like Nickasil lining, you know, yep. aluminium bores. And then we decided to bore them out. And, and put, put liners. liners in. So when did they first, do you remember the year they found themselves in a in a Roots competition car? No, we're going back to the days of Tony Lewis and Rosemary Smith. Wow. With their cars. Yeah, and, As, and, they, and they were works cars, were they? They were works cars, yeah. Wow, wow. So the head that I've also shown the YouTubers, it's like um, a deep angle head. Was that cast in your department as well? No, that came direct from Climax. From Climax, that's why it's got FWH. FWH. Yeah, because right. Climax heads. So Roots asked Climax, said, we want to do a head for this 998 bottom end. Yeah. And this is what they came... Because I had a phone call from a chap from Ireland who said that basically um, Ian Carter used to work for ERA... ERA was a research and development company and between Roots Department, Ian Carter and ERA and Climax, they came up with this yeah. cylinder head. The, the, the cylinder head is very, very similar to the, the one on the fire pump engine. Yes, it does look very similar. And it's the same arrangement, inlet, exhaust, inlet, exhaust, inlet, rather than... And they were cast at aeroplane and motor in Birmingham. Wow. Which is why most of them have got A&M on them. Yes, yeah. Because that's aeroplane and motor. So there was a t 10 of those made, was there, do you reckon? There was, we reckoned from memory there was 10 made. And they were all sort of partly machined, but they only ever finished five. Wow. Um, the one I own is number five. Right. Um, and the others were basically, they, the bits went out. Ian Carter had quite a few of the heads. He had quite a few of the blocks, the remaining blocks. Yeah, and yeah. Ian, Ian machined them himself, the heads and the blocks, and Ian built them up. Right. But not all of them. Um, oh. The biggest issue was the cranks. They were made by Farndon. And we only had five cranks made. We didn't have the ten cranks made. So there was only... So there's blocks without cranks? Yeah, there was blocks with no cranks and no rods. Because they're different. Uh, different length rod as well, yeah, of yeah. course. Um, Dennis Alt had got a crank from somewhere, I don't know where. Brian Tavender had got a crank, because I saw it at Brian's. Whether that's the one that went to Dennis or not, I'm not sure. Mm. But Brian wouldn't sell it. I tried to buy it off him and he refused to sell it. <laughs> right, um, right. And I know there were some other bits and pieces um, finished up in the canal in Coventry when they had the big purge. Are oh, you joking? What, they actually just turfed it? Yeah, the people who'd got it shouldn't have had it and therefore they were checking people's houses and a lot of stuff went into the canal. Really? Especially in competition stuff. Did it? Which canal? I'm going. <laughs> no way. So, how old were you when you were in the Roots Experimental Department? Uh, I started there in... I can't remember what year I started. 19... Oh, anyway, I was, I was 15 when I started at Roots. Right. Um, because I couldn't sign my apprenticeship till I was 15 because I was 14 because of my school leaving age. Right, right. And, and when I was 21, I moved from... Well, I finished my apprenticeship... But I did the last two years in experimental 
um, courtesy of David Lloyd, who was the big boss. Wow. I'd seen him and Dave and I got on well and he allowed me And that, to that's where your love affair for the would have come from, isn't yeah. it? Because, I mean, you've made a, a, a living for a lifetime of building racing. I mean, sorry, you worked at a college, didn't you, as a tutor? Uh, yeah, I did some part-time work at the college. Um, you've always run Corley Conversions, but, I take it? Yeah. Well, my dad started Corley Conversions. He started it during the war as Bolt Brothers right. with Uncle Stan. And Uncle Stan decided to go his own route. So dad changed the name to Corley Conversions. And dad and I worked on it initially, mainly with Austin Sevens for 754. Yeah. Which we'll come to that now. You've gone the full circle, haven't you? At the age of 79, Nine. you started racing the Formula 750 again. Yeah. Superb, that is. That's that, the that's same a... car that I raced in the 60s and that my mum used in 1964 in the six hour Silverstone race. Wow, that's some history, that. Yeah. It's fair play. Well, yeah, I mean, I hope I can achieve as much <laughs> in my time on planet sure Earth. Will. Yeah, I've got to live to 79 first, but we'll just concentrate on getting to 49 first. <laughs> but uh, that's absolutely fascinating. So, I was just going to ask one more question regarding the tuning of these imp engines obviously you've done a lot of development with them and tuning with them i'm taking off from where you guys have been and i'll be honest with you we haven't seen anything massive we're still around 105 110 horsepower mark for a good 1040 you know 75 foot pound we're getting a better spread of power but there seems to be something that's like the sticking thing that's why we can use more rpm obviously but I think back in the day, people probably used more. That's where some of the bigger figures came from. But what's the best imp engine that you've ever seen and had? Most of my 1040s, when I was doing them specifically for racing, were producing 125. But you have told me this before, they weren't on pump fuel, were they? Yeah, they were. They were on oh, I thought they were on like... The um, engines were on pump fuel. Oh, I thought they were on methanol. But they were, no, the, the ones in the Saracen, for instance, that one, I've got 134 on methanol. <laughs> Wow. And Darren Grasby running his fancy fuels has got more than that out of his. Really? Because he's running on fancy fuels, but he's on full injection money. Yeah, the money. injection must help, giving it the yeah, air. Yeah, yeah. Help. See, I, I don't tend to touch on the injection, I'll be honest. I'm, I'm more about the historic job and the, um, you know, we can use the switched ignition, but mm. everything's on the carburetors. And yeah, um, yeah well... I'll keep plugging away and uh, hopefully we'll, uh, we'll, this new engine I'm doing with Dennis, which is, I know you had a, a key part in developing the Ian Gunton, the five bearing job um, for the Guntons when they were racing them. So hopefully we're going to see some serious RPM and he's hoping to come out with the, uh, the clan. We reckon we're, we're going to try and run to 9,500 RPM. Do you think it's uh, attainable? It's, it, it is, but it's it's difficult if you're running on the end. The head won't breathe. That's your biggest issue. Yeah, That's yeah. That's why they only rev to about eight and a half. Yeah, power. yeah, and yeah, as yeah. As you've seen on the dyno. Yeah, they just... to go over the top at eight and a half. Just, yeah, they can't get any more air. So, sorry, I'm getting overexcited. If things go into my head, if I don't say them straight away, I forget. Do you think that the Coventry development head, the FW, whatever it is... Yeah. Do you think that, in your experience, did that breathe better? Because I haven't even run one yet. It breathes better, but you've got to do a lot of work on it to get it to breathe better. Right. It's slightly impaired. It's, the ports are not, you know, not the right shape. Right, they right. Need, they need bringing into modern thinking on the port shape. Right, OK. And the other thing that slows it down with a lot of them is the camshaft. Right. I mean, we know that most of the race boys run GE3s. Hmm. Um, everybody seems happy with those, but... With the hill climb engines and mine, I were running the big horsepower. That was running my own designer camshaft. Yeah, was it called a DA10 or was that a Cosworth no, ground? Um, a GA, GA, a GE7. A GE7, because yeah. I had a DA10 once and I rang you many yeah. moons ago. That's the same. The, the DA10 ones are the ones that I did um, for me while I, was, while I was working with Andy. Let me answer that. It's Gary trying to... I'll pause. I'll, I'll, we'll restart now. We're over the phone call. Okay, sorry. So I just said the DA10 cam was the one that I'd rang you about and you'd give me some figures for it. It was one of your cams, I'm sure it was. Yeah, it was. Right. Yeah, that's... Uh, 400 thou. Yeah, 410. Was that a Cosworth grind? Yeah, it's Cosworth. Cosworth. L1 or something. Based differently. Yeah, different load separation. So different right. load separation. Right. Um, then went on from that to... Because Andy and I were trying to develop a, a 410 lift cam between us. Right. And 
I got the power on his dyno out of the mine, out the DA10 one, um, with the separation, and it was better than the camera that he'd done. And I can't remember what profile he'd used, but he'd used a different profile. So we decided that we would actually put together, instead of a GE3, one called GE7. Right. And that's what we were going to do. And then, of course, unfortunately, Andy was killed in Germany. Oh, this is Andy Chesman you're talking yeah, about? Andy Chesman. He was, he was killed in Germany. And his speedboat, so, wasn't it? Yep. So I, I carried on and I made some, and I, I had them made. And I think I made about 10 of them, and they were stamped up GE7, because I felt that was right for Andy. Hmm. It was to put GE7 on them, because that's what we were going to market them as. Wow, wow. Um, Great. Well, I mean, uh, since then, I've had a lot of help from Bob Jones, who he designed a, a, a a camshaft for me on the Lotus program and uh, it took him about probably it took him three or four attempts but one was he said it wasn't doing the right thing I couldn't at the time we did it this is when I was working for him which is probably 15 years ago now I didn't really understand fully what was going on but he kept on tweaking it and um yeah I've kept with that now and I, I just put that in all my races I like it it works from four and a half thousand it does have a, doesn't have the same sort of like a, a twenty three an R twenty three will just carry on going, won't it? You know, it does fall off at the top, but I find that that mid range really helps a lot of the four speed cars that have got a bit of weight in them. And you know, anyway, yeah, yeah, it's just it's all about that area under the curve, isn't it? So that's what you need. Yeah, yeah. Well, Ben, thank you so much for that insight into you know Roots Competition Department because you know. It's amazing to think that you, you were there when all this happened, all them years ago. And I, I, th I was thinking on the way up here about my first time I rang you. I first rang you after a HSA, I've been to a hill climb event. I've got, it's got to be like 98 or something. And your wife answered the phone and I said, hi, could I speak to Ben? I wanted to buy like a 9 on 8 piston off you or something. And uh, you were in the field unloading the car after a race meeting and you came over. It's weird because I, I have a really weird history in my head. I only remember certain things, but I remember the, the day that I spoke to you. It must have stuck in my head for a reason. There you go. Anyway, right. Thank you very much, Ben. Right. I'll, uh, I'll let you get on with your day now. And uh, you, if you get bored on Sunday night at seven, you can come with your popcorn and watch yourself on TV. Great. All right. Thanks, cheers. Thank you. Right, chaps, for the next part of this video, we're going to do something a bit unconventional. So... I wouldn't ever do this for a customer. I'm just purely doing it for my own learn. Now, I was just Googling around on YouTube, on YouTube, on eBay, and uh, found some nice pistons and rods, 74 mil bore motorbike pistons, and they're out of a Honda CBR. And I thought, oh, I'll, I'll use these in it. I've got a project engine, which I've not shared with you guys yet, because I want to see if it works first. But I wanted a short compression height piston, so... I thought for 100 quid, I'll just buy them and we'll have a look at them. So they've arrived and yeah, look nice, you know, nice little forged piston. Very light. The whole reciprocating mass is 500, kilog uh, 500 grams, whereas the, uh, the lightest imp steel rod with forged piston is like 725. So a real good weight saving there for your reciprocating mass. Anyway, I started looking at it and I thought, you know what? It's a longer rod than the imp, but it doesn't look like it. So I thought I'd do some measuring. So from the, the top deck here to the center line of the um, of the of the crank pin, I'll just get something to point. Is basically from so from oh gosh, what have I done here now? Right. So from the the top of the piston to the center line of the crank pin is on the Honda CBR 128 millimeters, and on the imp it's 131.15. So 3.15 millimeters shorter overall although the actual rod length from center to center is longer on the honda because it's got a shorter compression height which is from here to here so i know that if i take three mil off top of the imp block i can run this piston and rod however it's on a very small big end it's on a 36 mil big end so obviously we're on 41.25 which is inch and five eighths for our big end pin so I was thinking, oh, that's a shame because that's really light. We could use that and it's got good dynamics, etc. And it'd be cheap. Then I thought, ah, oh. when I clear, I helped clear, the Imp Club cleared some of um, Ian Carter's um, tools and uh, engines and stuff out of his unit at his house. 
Um, obviously, he'd since passed a long time beforehand, but he, the, his wife contacted the imp club and asked if they could move some stuff. So I went to help and basically met uh, one of the subscribers on here, which is Stephen, which is uh, the, the son-in-law. So great guy. And he basically said all these old tools and stuff, you know, all the and stuff. And I mean, it's not often I get excited about this or about anything really, but <laughs> this is proper. Um, this is what the Ian used back in the day to do his crank offsets. So you put this part in the lathe, which I'll do in a minute to explain. And then you can see he's got all of his different crank, off, uh, crank offsets on here. So for a 58 mil throw, you simply line that dowel up there. For a 60 mil throw, which is standard, oh sorry, you'd line that one. For 63.8, you'd line that one, 65, so forth. And then we've got the big ones here. We've got 69.5 and 70, which is like 1200 cc. So the imp crank bolts in here, you'd obviously clock it all up, move it across. And he's made all this, you know, because if you look at a lot of his cranks, he'd done a lot of uh, welding to the cranks to make them a bigger journal and then obviously machined it back down again. And this would be the tool that he used. So you have this, this is the flywheel end. This will go in the chuck. And then this end has got a revolving sensor in it. And that would go in your tailstock. And then obviously this is an imp um, front pulley without the pulley on it. And he's basically bolted it to this. And that whole lot slides as well. And it's got exactly the same setup. So you obviously you do the same offset each end. And we'll put it in a lathe in a minute to see. But you'll, you'll see what it does is the whole crank goes round offset and the crank pin stays true so we can machine it now obviously i've got to go from 41.25 to 36 mils quite a lot of material so it's going to reduce the strength of the crankshaft we'll talk about that in a minute when i get the crank out uh which isn't good so i'm not suggesting i'd ever do this for a customer it's just purely for my own learn but there's one more thing i want to say about this setup is the thing that re makes me really excited about it I mean, obviously, this bloke's thought a lot, and he? he's obviously thought, how can I go about this job? Is If you look, he's made it from imp flywheels. So this is an imp flywheel machined. Be and I, I might have to say, absolutely beautifully machined. And this is also an imp flywheel. And guess what this is? <laughs> an imp flywheel with an imp front boss bolted on. And then obviously we've got another imp flywheel and it's bolted it to a revolving center. What an absolute genius. So, you know, this is, these are the sorts of people that don't exist anymore. He had a problem. He wanted to get around it. He looked at what he had available to fix the solution and then engineered this. I'm just so glad that it's actually going to get used again. I can't wait to get a crank in it and, uh, and crack on. Okay, chaps, we just watched the first part of the video that I've made regarding the uh, offset grinding tool. And I realised that I made a bit of an error in that I, I used the term reciprocating mass. Well, it wasn't really correct that because when I think about it, the piston goes up and down. But this bit, especially this bit, goes round and around. So I'm not sure quite where we draw the line and say the part that reciprocates. That's just the piston, really, and maybe part of the rod. But... The rest of it goes round. So I'll try and keep my terminology quite simple before I uh, overstep the mark and end up getting me, myself in a bit of a tongue tie. So well, now that I've got it cleared up, I just wanted to talk about the crankshaft for a second. I've just pulled an old crank out of the... This is me for grinding pile. And um, I've had a measure of it and it's a bit down. So I thought we'll just have a look and decide what is down in case you guys at home are looking at um, doing a crank, you know. So... The inch, uh, the inch, the uh, imp pins, the big end pins are one inch and five eighths. That is um, sort of top limit. Most of them end up roughly between one inch six two four and one inch six two four and five tenths. So that's basically half a thou. So it's one inch six hundred and twenty four thou, and then five tenths, which is half a thou. So. I'll just throw the uh, G clamp on this now and we'll measure it together. And I'm getting this down at like one inch, six, two, three, um, and maybe about six tenths. 
which is just a little bit under. I just measured it, <laughs> didn't come out. It's oval, so we've got to get it right. Because obviously your, your journals, you have to measure it in several areas because they don't wear around because of the nature of the job. They're always getting pushed on one side on, on, the, on the power stroke. So that's the side that wears, you know. So you can see there, if I zoom in, hang on. That's basically bang on, maybe... One inch, six, two, four, and one tenth. So I did measure this journal. I think it was this number two. I measured it and I thought, oh, it's right down there. It's not there. That's really strange. I'm saying it's okay now. <laughs> Just where I look. Ah, oh, there we are. So if you look at it now, you'll see it's right down i'd say it's one inch six two three and maybe one tenth or two tenths so that will call that it won't have a knock and it'll actually be absolutely fine in a road car but for a racer we, we try and get them right up at the top limit because um we, we don't want too much oil passing and too much moving around and all the rest of it we want to keep the pressures nice and high so I'm quite happy to sacrifice this crank now. This is just purely for a learn what I'm going to do with this uh, this crank grinding, this this offset crank job. So I've got my dial ready, which is here. What I'm going to do is I'm going to put the whole lot in the lathe, get it clocked up on here to zero here and here, so I know it's all round, and then I'll move it across with my dial to sixty point four, which is a standard throw, and then hopefully that'll put this and this in line with the center then and we'll be able to machine it okay we've got the crank ready to go in the lathe but before i do that i'll just do a little chat with you about a few problems i've noticed now these are called engineering compromises so <laughs> that's why i'd never do this for a customer i'd only ever do it for myself basically the rod is narrower than the journal on the imp crank so we'll have to make it what we call a piston guided rod which means we'll put little shims either side of the little end there, which will guide the rod, hence why it's called a piston guided rod. Now, I've done this before on other engines that have been sort of, uh, we'll call them development engines, and it works quite well. Now, because I'm gonna lose six mil off this journal, the biggest, when, when people look at a crankshaft, and the reason that a lot of automotive stuff goes big journal, is it's because of the overlap between the main and the big end. So the bigger the journal, the more overlap you've got, which is, is your strength really because that, the smaller you make this pin the less strength you can carry through that part of the crankshaft so when i machine this now i'm going to go in with my radius tool and what i'm going to do is you can see as standard the imp has quite a nice radius in the corner because every all the stress razors start from a you know from a sharp corner now on a lot of modern crankshafts it's called like a fillet rolled crank where you'll see almost an undercut and then a roll it and that's where they've rolled it rather than machined it because they've compressed the steel you know and made it nice and strong because they know that that's a weak point when these imp cranks break by the way it starts in that corner there and goes <coughs> normally at number one end not at number four which you'd think all the power is going through the last journal but it's another subject completely but someone a lot cleverer than me basically said if you have an imp crankshaft fail at the opposite end from the drive so it's doing it number one he said what you've got is a torsional vibration issue so because this end's been driven this end is basically getting a shake on at big rpm and that's what causes them to snap so we don't get that now that we've limited limited the engines to 8500 but a certain uh, mr benoy used to enjoy using 95 for most of the season <laughs> but anyway we put them on a steel crank now so then problems have gone away so the imp standard crank we run to 8.5, absolutely fine. God knows what we can run this to. Obviously, like I said before, the, the weight of this is now nearly 200 grams or 200 grams and a bit lighter than my lightest imp rod and piston. So there'd be a lot less stress, especially at speed due to the lack of weight. The question is, will that lack of weight be enough to make the crankshaft hold together with the smaller pin diameter because it's going from 41.25 to 36. So 
what I propose to do is, now I did think about doing it and then getting it finished ground, but I reckon if I take my time and make a nice job of this and leave a couple of thou on for polishing, I'll be able to get this down to size with my tool and then polish it myself because that way I can, because when you take the crank for grinding, I don't actually speak to the guy anymore, bless him, he's retired, but I wouldn't be dealing with the guy who, 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 who grinds the crank. So it's quite hard to get across to people that you want them to leave the radius in the corner. So I've got this tool here and what I propose to do is I'm going to go in and that lovely big radius there that you can see on the tool, I'm going to leave that in the corners so that as much strength can be left in the crank as possible to give it the best possible chance of doing like 9,000 RPM without all the bits flying out the side of the block. So we'll get it on the crank, on the on the live, can't wait to clock it up and uh, yeah, join you again. Right chaps, you have to sort of bear with me a bit because I'm on a bit of a learning curve myself. So I've put the assembly with the uh, special Ian Carter offset tool in the four jaw and in the revolving centre, I've locked the tailstock up, so everything's set. Now, I was trying to think, how would he have gone about this? Because it's the first time for me. So I'm thinking, if I was Ian Carter now, I'd imagine the first thing he'd do is to clock the rear main up with it set, and it's it's got like some zero, zero da uh, dowel holes. So I put them at the, the, the dowel pin in on the zero. All this looks very nice and smooth. And gone round, so I've clocked it up, so this is now true to the rear main. And now what I think his next step would be, would be to um, undo these two pinch bolts here and here, here and here, there's four of them, and then do the slide. So what I'll do is get my ratchet, pop him in gear. Just undo these and then what we'll do is we'll slide it along and we'll put the dowel in the 60.4 position hole, which is the standard stroke for the imp. I should have got some pliers in there. Right, pins out. Okay, so I slide it across. Nothing done on them. Yeah, we've done all them. Undone them. What's that hitting? Ah, uh, I've done something wrong here. I've got a feeling the bolts in the back of the flywheel are catching because it won't give me the slide. Right, I'll have to pause this and take it out and start again. Okay. I made a mistake there. It wasn't the bolts catching. It was me being silly. Basically, the you can only hold the sliding plate with one pinch bolt because you run out of traverse or travel on this side. So the you can only, you have to take one of the bolts out. But we've got bigger problems than that because I've obviously clocked it up in the dialed position. Uh, so I thought, well, if, if we're doing standard stroke, this big end pin should be true now to the uh, the jig, but it's miles out so i'm thinking rather than clocking up off the rear pin what i'll do is i'll clock up off the outside of here and then what i'll do is i'll check it again because i suspect i should have clocked this is actually out as well you see because i've done it off the center but anyway we'll, we'll work out the thought path because we can't ask him okay i've just clocked it up to this outside diameter here um and when i put the clock on the big end pin it's still a country mile out, it's like eight thou there before it hits the web. So I just thought to myself, what, what am I doing? I, I'm not changing the stroke. I just want to take material off the big end pin uniformly. So all I've got to do is use the four jaw to clock that. So that's true to that. If that's true, I can machine it. So all this is irrelevant because we're not doing any offsets at the moment, but I do wonder if what he would have started by doing was clocking up on the big end pin with the stand with the 60.4 pin locks in the in the slider got that true both ends and then put his offset on to do to do the uh, offset because that way it'd be definitely right to the original crank anyway it's all by the by now i'll clock this up 
with this straight on the big end pin that I'm going to machine and then we'll start machining and I can't wait. Right, I've plotted this up now on this front pin just by shifting the jaws on there. I've not bothered taking any of this into account. I'm just purely thinking to myself, we want machine number four big end pin. So I'll get that true and we'll just machine that. This end does run out ever so slightly, but it's not in this axis, it's in this axis, about out 3,000. So I thought, concentrate on this, we'll get this while we know this is all nice and true. I'll machine this and then we'll get on the other end and see if we can fettle it a little bit, get it a bit closer. Right, we're finally ready to machine. Uh, it's in neutral, always do a lap, make sure nothing catches. Um, so you can see now the whole point of how this operation works, uh, the big end pin is true, everything else is uh, out of balance. So it's going to have a right old shake on. Um, I'm going to go real slow, I'm just going to start it on like 85 revolutions. Now, uh, this I hate having a tool stuck out this far, a lot of flexing, vibration. No idea what the finish is going to be like, no idea what it's going to be like to turn. I'm just going to get stuck into it and uh, make some adjustments as we go along. Right, chaps, I've got to be honest, I'm not right keen stood on that being right next to this when it's going round. And then we're going slow. But uh, we'll put it in gear and uh, I'll show you. It could, we could be in for a long night. Got a fair bit of material to remove. I'll turn it on. Put it in gear. We're using the feed rate on the saddle to take the the traverse to move the saddle towards the uh, the chuck. It's actually cutting all right considering it's stuck out that far. You can see it's quite a nice quality steel. I think the EN8 is the standard these guys have. So it does turn quite nicely. Anyway, I'm turning the camera up because I've just got to do it concentrating. Right, chaps, I'm at that point I've... Uh, we're going to make it this evening. We're going to get a dry build, which I've, this is what I wanted to achieve. So. Obviously, I've got my comrade here. This is my crankshaft that I've just machined the first journal on. I've got my sizes, my 36 mil, um, basically comes out at one inch, 417th hour, and uh, five temps. So what I've done, is so I can get a dry build on the go, I've made this five foul down from that, so it's minus one inch, 412. And the reason I've done that is I'd like to get 10 foul shells in here, so I can. What I, I wanted to do a dry build basically before I start buying anything or spending any money. This will now go straight on here, no problem. Bit of clearance on it, obviously, we'll have to take that into account. We do piss tonight, um, but it'll give me an idea of the next set of problems that are going to be thrown up. Obviously, it's piston guided, so it's the radiuses. I'm really happy with them, but we're gonna have to sort out obviously getting it ground down to the finished size. Not interested in that for now. My interest is purely. Let's get it in the car, in the engine, and let's see what it looks like. Because uh, it does look a little bit, you know, iffy. I've got to be honest, it looks a bit small, that pin. We've definitely lost a lot of the crankshaft strength. But obviously, the proof of the pudding's in the eating. We shall see what happens when it's on the dyno at 9,000 RPM. Uh, <laughs> right, I'm going to get this out now, and we'll get a build on before I go home. Right, the moment of truth. The piston and rod's in, and it goes round. As predicted, it's like three mil short at the top dead centre. Now, um, obviously, we can do something with the deck of the block to get around that. But this is why I'd never do anything like this as a business proposition, because all the compromises start coming into effect. We've got all these exhaust, there are two exhaust pockets here, which will lower the compression considerably. And we've got two inlet pockets that will be in the wrong place. So by the time we've remachined the piston, we compromise the strength in it, etc. I'm still going to continue with it and see it through just because uh, I'm in interested to see how the lack of weight affects the uh, the way the engine accelerates and performs. So we'll still get a learn at some point, but yeah, I don't think it's um, it's the way to go forward with regards to uh, imp tuning. Although, you know, gotta be honest, what a cheap way of creating a um, 1040cc imp engine with um, a proper piston and rod in it, you know. This, uh, this rod and piston is designed to do 14,000 RPM in the motorbike. So it should be well on for, um, you know, nine in an imp. All, of course, providing the crankshaft doesn't call it a day. Um, it, it all looks quite at home in there, to be honest. Um, yeah, obviously, we've got a little bit of play in the big end because it's uh, five foul down. You can't actually feel it, but it, is, it isn't right. So we'll have to get the crank round. But I'm going to continue with it, see it through get a tune out of it and see what we learn. 
Okay, going on from Wednesday night with the uh, the dry build with the uh, modern piston and rod on the uh, imp crankshaft that I turned down to 36 mil. Um, you've heard that, that saying, measure twice, cut once. Well, Uncle Dipstick here made a right old blunder because what I wanted to do was on that night, I was so desperate to get a dry build out of it that this, this needs to be 36 mil finished size. Now, if I was going to leave it at 36 and take it for final grinding, I was going to have to leave 5 on it, which meant I wouldn't have been able to get my big end on to do a dry build. So I thought, oh, I know what I'll do. I'll make it 5 far under 36 mil, and then I can take it and get it ground, to, and I'll buy some plus 10 thou bearings for the Honda uh, rod, and then that leaves, I can get a dry build tonight, and then, you know, we'll have a bit of play in it, but not, we can cope with that. And then um, I can send the crank off and I've done all the journals and get it ground. But you can't get oversized bearings for this particular type of motorbike engine. I don't know because it's got induction hardened pins or whatever, but they're just not available. They do like a colour system, but you can just about see it on the side there. So they, they vary in like flipping tenths of a foul because the Japanese are good at this job. You know, they, they, they know what they're doing. They, uh, they're really up on their tolerances. So that was a total blunder. So this crankshaft is now redundant. So, I've got another one, another scrap crank in the lathe, and I did try and um, made I made a new tool to go in because obviously the problem is as the job goes round, you end up with a situation where um, you need the, the 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 tool stuck out loads so you can cut it. That's not ideal for vibration and stuff. So I've tried to make a new tool out of tool steel, but it's just not man enough. So we're going to have to go back to the carbide tip and um, maybe slim that tool down a bit so we can get the, the, the radius just how we want it, etc. So I'll concentrate on that and hopefully I'll get this crank looking something like uh, before the weekend ready to go for... N next time I'll just make it above 36 mil so that we can... Because uh, I know what it's going to do in the engine and then we'll send it off for grinding.